Hello and welcome everyone to Varsity Tutors, where if Muhammad Ali bragged like he floated like one, and Michael Phelps is famous for swimming like one, and all of our days get a little bit better just because we saw one, we should try to learn about whatever that is, right? Of course, I'm talking about the butterfly, and we have maybe the world's foremost butterfly expert, Phil Torres from Discovery Channel and uh, Animal Planet and all kinds of places, here to talk to us about butterflies. And before we get started, let me just say, Phil mentioned to me before class that he gets butterflies in his stomach when he's about to talk to a group of, of kids this big. There are thousands of you out there. So let's make it easy on him. I think a lot of you have found that chat panel right next to the video player here. Uh, he's going to ask you some questions to find out what you know about butterflies. Um, so make sure you answer those there. And if you have any questions whatsoever about butterflies, type those in, put your name on them so we know who's asking. And in the last 10 minutes or so of class, we'll make sure we cover as many of those questions as we can. Some good ones are already coming in. Should also know about Phil that he is uh, one of the world's preeminent wildlife photographers. I'll show you his camera in a little bit. So of course we've got to have a photo session, have a camera nearby. And in about a half an hour, we'll give you a chance to take a selfie with Phil. And if you upload it to Instagram, you'll have a chance to win a butterfly net, just like that one over his shoulder there. So uh, make sure you've got a camera nearby, keep it interactive. Uh, and with that said, my job here is to be the caterpillar, just getting things ready for when they really get exciting. So let me turn it over. The metamorphosis is complete to your teacher for today, Phil Torres. Thank you, Brian. Uh, wow. I am just so excited to be here because um, if you haven't figured out yet, my favorite thing in the world is butterflies. And we're going to be talking about a few things here. So I want to kind of give you a little overview of the different topics that we're going to be hitting. Brian, you got it for me? All right. Well, we're going to start with just how beautiful butterflies are. Everybody knows that, right? And then we're, but it's interesting why they're actually beautiful. Then we're going to get to the bold, brave butterflies. They're way more bizarre and weird and adventurous than you ever knew. And then importantly, how you right now can help butterflies. I mean, so that's it. I mean, it's going to be great. I know I've loved butterflies since I was little. I know a lot of you love butterflies. And if you love them even just this much, even just a tiny bit, by the end of this, you're going to love them like hugely. So let's talk about that. What is your favorite thing about butterflies? I want to know this because I think that's, that tells you a lot about the way that you see the world. So is it, I'm seeing, okay, some good answers coming in here. Seeing a lot of people saying, A, they're colorful wings, which are not just beautiful, but they're also really interesting. We're going to get into that. Um, some E, how they help the environment. They absolutely do. We're going to be talking about that as well. But I'm not seeing anybody choose D, the way they smell. And I don't know if that means none of you have ever smelled a butterfly before, but I'm guessing that's what it means. And you wouldn't expect that butterflies smell good, but let me just say, we're going to get into it later and your mind is going to be blown about these things. Um, so I want to introduce myself. My name is Phil Torres. I spend a lot, a lot of time in jungles like this, running around with a headlamp around my neck, a big camera in front of me. And the reason I do that is because I think the world is a fascinating place. Now, let me tell you how I got started. At seven years old, I started my first butterfly collection. At that point, pretty much every day, I'd go to the local park and I'd bring home snakes. I'd bring home snake skins. I'd bring home bones. But I really got into collecting butterflies because I would just have so much fun all day trying to collect new species. There was a time where me and an eight-year-old found a species that had never been recorded in Colorado before. And we were eight years old. So if we could do that at that age, I just dreamt big. And I was like, imagine what I could do when I'm older and I could travel the world and try to make real discovery. So at 11, I bought this. I saved up my money and I got my butterfly net, which I still use to this day. I'm going to give you a little demo how to use a butterfly net. Um, so imagine a butterfly is flying right here. So what you want to do is you want to obviously swing to get it in the net, but then you do a little loop so that this part catches the butterfly. So let me show you without knocking the computer over whoop, like that. So imagine the butterfly here, you swing, you swirl, and then it gets caught in this bottom part and you can get in there and see what you got. 
I'm gonna make sure this doesn't fall on me. It's good to have on hand in case a butterfly flies into the room. So from that age, I just knew that, hey, I wanna see the world and see it to discover things and to meet interesting people. So I set out to do just that. And I was lucky that, um, you know, worked really hard in high school, went to Cornell University for entomology, and I got to be a scientist. I was, you know, by the age of 20, I was going to Venezuela for uh, entomological expeditions, then going to Mongolia, then going to Central America. And I was getting this experience as a scientist where we were discovering 40 new species in three and a half weeks in Venezuela. It was crazy. And the adventures we would do, we would go track down waterfalls across the country. I got stuck in a forest full of quicksand. Um, you know, I got held at gunpoint. There were some scary times. There was exciting times. There was happy times. I met some of the most fascinating people in the world, ate some of the weirdest food, including fermented horse milk in Mongolia. So imagine horse milk and then leave it out for like two weeks in the sun and then drink it. To them, it's a delicacy. I can't say it's my favorite, but it wasn't that bad. It was actually kind of good. So having these experiences as a scientist, it made me realize that yes, the science is really important and discovering these species, but so is telling their story. And that's when I started to think about getting into things like photography. So I use this, this is my, my big uh, macro lens. That a close photo of an animal so I can document different species I'm seeing, take videos, share those. And then also got into the idea of talking about science and insects and animals on television. So that's what I've been doing the last seven years. Worked as a science reporter. I've worked on a lot of different shows that let me just share what I love most. And it all started with my love of butterflies. So let's say we learn about some butterflies. Let's get into it. All right. A lot of you chose, you know, the, the beauty, that A answer of what's your favorite thing about butterflies. And what's interesting is the, the reasons that they have color to begin with. So we're going to talk about camouflage, deception, and even poison here. But it brings up a question, why have color at all? Why is it that butterflies are so beautiful to look at? Is it just for us so we could look at them and say, oh, look at that pretty you know, yellow sulfur or an orange monarch. Um, I mean, it, it doesn't hurt. I, I do enjoy that about them. But the real reason that they have color is, is twofold. One, it's to communicate with each other. So it helps them recognize the same species. They don't have the best vision, but a lot of butterflies' wings look actually different to a butterfly itself because they, they see in ultraviolet. So the wing may have a certain pattern in ultraviolet light that signals to a male butterfly that, hey, that's a female butterfly, the same species. Um, that's a small part. But the other big part of why butterflies have color in these patterns is because butterflies are delicious. Yes, I said it. Birds love eating them. Mammals love eating them. I've even seen monkeys jump out of a tree, grab a butterfly in the air, shove it in their mouth. Right? So. Obviously, I'm not going to go around eating butterflies, but to a wild animal out there, they see butterflies as a source of food. And that presents a problem to butterflies because they obviously don't want to get eaten because that's the end of their story. So there's a few ways that they have these colors to avoid getting eaten. One of them is camouflage. Now, we can all kind of imagine what camouflage would look like. There are butterflies, especially on the underside of their wing, that will look exactly like bark or look exactly like a dead leaf. It'll even have little clear spots in it. And the details that you get in that are incredible that they've evolved to have that much detail. And whenever you see that much detail in something, that tells you that the reason it evolved must be strong, which means birds have great vision, monkeys have great vision. So if you're gonna hide from them, you gotta be really good at hiding. But butterflies can't sit still and camouflage all day. Sometimes they got to fly around to get food, to lay eggs, to do all those things. So another tactic that they do with their wings is they startle predators. So when they land, they show off. Look at that. Look at those eye spots. These are three different species, and all of them have eyes that look like they're staring at you. And the one on the bottom left even looks like it almost looks like a snake's head, if you kind of imagine it flipped upside down, where it has eyes and a nose. So that is the second reason that they have these colors, is to startle predators, to confuse them, 
a predator goes in thinking it's about to eat a butterfly and all of a sudden sees these eyes staring at it, that's going to make that predator pause and maybe sit back for a second or two seconds. And in that second or two seconds, that gives that butterfly a chance to escape, to get away and to survive. And that's really what evolution is all about, is these traits that get uh, introduced into a population that help them survive. And then lastly, the colors, the bright colors we see in so many butterflies, like orange, yellow, red, and black, when they're combined with that, usually indicates that that butterfly is poisonous. Now, the monarch butterfly is a great example of that. We're going to talk about them later. But they have that orange and black because as a caterpillar, they eat milkweed, which has a heart toxin in it. So essentially, if you ate one of those butterflies, your heart would go crazy. So you don't want to do that. You basically don't want to eat any butterflies or anything with bright colors because that is their way of, of telling things that, hey, I'm announcing I'm here. I'm saying I'm a butterfly. Normally, you'd want to eat me. Normally, I'm delicious. But look at my colors. That is saying, do not eat me because you will regret it. And birds learn that really quick. Birds are actually very, very smart when it comes to predators. Lots of times when they're young, they make a mistake once. They'll maybe eat one monarch or eat a bit of it, and then they'll feel really sick and puke it out. And then they're like, all right, I've learned nothing with those bright colors, never gonna eat those again. So that is one of the big parts about why they have these colors. And I know a lot of you said that that is your favorite part about them is how beautiful they are. But one of my favorite things about butterflies is something that people don't expect. Yes, the most beautiful thing about butterflies to me is when you use your nose around them. So let me tell you a story. Where I worked in Ecuador, I lived in the Amazon rainforest for two years doing research on butterflies and mammals and birds and all these other things. And I had so many adventures, but think about how long it took me to get there. It would take me at least two six hour flights and then a five to seven hour drive through the Andes Mountains, and then a five hour boat ride. And then to get to my field site, sometimes it would take two to three hours of hiking. So I'm out there in the middle of the jungle. This one day is really when this, this smell thing hit me. I'm in the middle of the jungle. I obviously don't smell very good. One of the baits that we use to catch butterflies, you may not think about this attracting butterflies, but actually rotten fish. So I smell bad, the rotten fish smells really bad, but in this bait trap that we have, where butterflies come in, eat the fish, and then they fly up into, a, it's kind of like a giant butterfly net. I grab the butterfly using these special forceps that don't damage the wings, and I smelled it. And I'm in the middle of nowhere, and what do I smell? I smell vanilla cake. And then I grabbed another butterfly, and I smelled it. And what do I smell? I smelled brownie batter. All of a sudden, I'm in the middle of the jungle, far away from any of these familiar things that I grew up loving cake and loving brownie batter, and I'm smelling them on a butterfly. And that is just not what I was expecting to smell at that time. And when you really look at how butterflies smell, you'll realize that that actually happens probably in your backyard right now. If any of you know what a swallowtail butterfly is, we'll show an image of one of them at the end of this, but they're pretty big, they're black and yellow, and they oftentimes have a little tail at the end. There's black swallowtails, there's um, these tiger swallowtails that have more yellow, but the males of those all smell really good, like really good. Yes, that's one of the ones. So this is a swallowtail, and the male butterfly of this smells exactly like Fruit Loops, the cereal. Not even, it doesn't even smell like fruit, doesn't even smell like a real banana. It smells like Fruit Loops, the cereal. You smell that, you stick your face in a box of Fruit Loops, and you're like, these are the exact same smell. So why does a butterfly smell? Well, it's only the male butterflies that smell this way, and it's called a pheromone. And every species has a very unique scent. Sometimes we can't detect it, but other times we can detect it. And what that does is when the female butterfly comes up and she smells with her antennae, she's coming up and a male butterfly is over here. He'll oftentimes fly over her, waft his wings, spread his smell, and she'll say, oh, I'm smelling Fruit Loops. That means this is a male black swallowtail and I'm a female black swallowtail butterfly. So then they can mate, make eggs and caterpillars and create the next generation of butterflies. So 
if you're ever craving, you know, there's all these other smells that I get. I, I've smelled uh, barbecue potato chips. I've smelled burnt ketchup, maple syrup. So I've been in the jungle. And if I catch a certain butterfly that smells good, certain lodges that I work at in Peru, for example, tourists can come. And so I'll go around and put this butterfly in everybody's face and say, smell this, smell this, smell this. And it's just this delight that butterflies can actually smell really good. So if any of you happen to answer D when it came to that question of your favorite thing about them, then my hat's off to you because that's amazing that you knew they smelled. But if you want to smell a butterfly, a swallowtail butterfly is probably your best bet. If you get a butterfly net like this, which at the end of this, we might be giving away one of them, um, you can catch a butterfly, you can safely handle it, and then give it a good smell. Fruit Loops, there it is, it's amazing. All right, so um, let's get on to some of the other things about butterflies that are just so unexpected and so fascinating. Look at this question. Which of these is the only thing in this list that butterflies do not eat? So one of these, they do not eat. The rest, well, what does that mean about the rest? So I'm seeing some people saying turtle tears because who knew turtles had tears? Um, human blood, that would be terrifying, right? Um, ant legs, ant legs, because butterflies generally have to drink liquid. How could they eat a leg? Well, it ends up that, yes, that is the correct answer here. C, butterflies do not eat ant legs. But what does that say about the rest of those options? Well, let me tell you about an area in Peru that I work, which is magnificent. It's called Tambopata, and it's one of my favorite places on the planet. I go back multiple times a year to do research and to make videos and to tell stories there. Um, and on this one trail, we set up camera traps, basically a, a camera that when anything walks by, like a mammal comes by, it takes a photo of them. And we kept seeing that there was a lot of big cats in the area. We were getting jaguars, we were getting ocelots, and then their prey that they eat, things like peccary, these, these wild boar out there. So we knew there was a lot of predators out there, which was really exciting, these big mammals. So I was walking on this trail, looking around to see if I'd find a jaguar or something. When on the ground, I see a butterfly that I've never seen on the ground before. This is one of the rarest butterflies ever because it pretty much only lives up in the canopy of the rainforest, which I'm sure so many of you are just unbelievably smart and already know what the canopy is, which is basically where you walk down below in the jungle. This is like the understory, this is the ground. The canopy is at the very, very top of the trees where most of the leaves are. And it's an entire world of its own that some species basically live their entire life up in the canopy, like monkeys barely ever go to the ground. But this butterfly that lives in the canopy came to the ground. And I was like, what is it doing on the ground? And I looked and I realized that the reason it is on the ground is because it was feeding on a big, steamy, fresh pile of jaguar poop. Yep, one of the rarest, most beautiful butterflies in the world came down to the ground to feed on uh, poop. Now, um, why would it do that? Well, because uh, apparently jaguar poop actually has tons of things that they need that they can't get from flowers and they can't get from fruit. So that's my way of letting you know that butterflies do some really weird things. We're going to get into some of those. Um, let's, let's just talk about how fascinating butterflies are because they're aggressive eaters. They do some really weird stuff. If you look at that image, you'll say, I see turtles, I'm seeing butterflies. That can't be, but we'll get to that later. And then the middle, we're seeing amazingly adapted. The, the idea of an egg to a caterpillar, to a chrysalis, to an adult, there's a reason for that. And we'll talk about that. And then the world travelers, the monarch butterfly, which is so exciting because it's happening right now. We'll get to that. Now, let's start with this first section of aggressive eaters, right? So we've talked about how they will go for something like jaguar dung. Well, the reason that they do that is because there's certain nutrients in a place like the Amazon, they're really rare. They need salt for one thing, because salt isn't really found in plants, but animals need them. So a butterfly that as a caterpillar is eating uh, leaves, as a adult butterfly is eating nectar, where does it get the sodium if it can't get it from plants? Well, jaguar dung is one place, 
But the other, what is salty that we know of? When we cry or when we sweat, tears come down. If you ever taste that, it's salty. And believe it or not, turtles have tears too. Look at this. I've only seen this twice. And both times we were on a riverboat and I was like, stop the boat. We have to look at this. And these turtles are out there on the side of the river getting sun. They're, they're warming up because turtles are cold blooded. So to get warm, to do activities in the water, to hunt in the water, they have to get out there. But they also have eyes with tear ducts. So these butterflies, look at the one on the left. It is sitting on its face, sticking its proboscis in its eyeball, drinking tears. And there's two of them on that turtle at once and one on that other. So, oh my gosh, when I see this, it is like you're watching a Disney movie in real life. But this is real. When I first videotaped this and filmed this, um, there's not a lot of this documented out there. So I was one of the first people to put this film out there on the internet. And I had so many people telling me this was edited. This is fake. No way is this real. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me just, butterflies are so bizarre and so interesting that they don't even seem real. But there it was. How crazy is that? Now, their eating habits is one thing um, as adult, but as a caterpillar, let's, let's think about why. Why is it that a butterfly goes from egg to caterpillar to chrysalis, then adult? Now, you know, for us, we start as a baby and just get to a bigger form of us. Even grasshoppers, another insect, they start as a baby grasshopper and get bigger and bigger and bigger. But there's no such thing as a baby butterfly. They start as a caterpillar and then get big. And then they turn into a chrysalis and come out a butterfly that is a full-size adult. Now, the reason they do this is a little bit unknown, but scientists hypothesize that the advantage of being a caterpillar when you're young is that you're just trying to get big. You're, as a insect, your goal is basically turn into an adult and then you can mate, you can reproduce, you can create another generation of insects and, and kind of your job is done. So for a butterfly, the most efficient way of growing is not as a butterfly where they have this kind of proboscis, this tube that just drinks up stuff. It's as a caterpillar. Now, a caterpillar is essentially a glorified version of a mouth, a tube, and a butt. All they do all day is eat through the mouth, they process it through the tube and grow, and then it goes out the back end. And there's actually a special word for caterpillar poop that scientists use. And I want all of you to write this down, to learn this word. The word is frass. F-R-A-S-S, -S. frass. It's one of my favorite little scientific vocab words. It makes you seem real smart when you look at a caterpillar poop and you're like, oh, look at that frass. So write that one down because it's a fun one to tell your friends. And it's, it also just really lets you realize like caterpillars, if you ever have raised one, maybe some of you out there have raised painted lady butterflies or a monarch, um, you see how much frass they're dropping all day because they're eating all day. So the purpose of a caterpillar is just to be a tube that grows and grows and grows because they're really efficient at that. And then the purpose of an adult butterfly is to be able to disperse, to fly around, um, you know, to drink nectar for energy so that then it can find a mate and lay some eggs somewhere. So they've actually evolved a very efficient system where when they're young, they've evolved this body form that lets them eat. When they're adults, they've evolved this body form that lets them fly around and meet a mate and lay eggs and create the next generation of butterflies that we all know is so important. Um, and then migration. Migration is one of the most incredible phenomena that you will ever hear about or see in the animal kingdom. So maybe some of us have seen stuff about, um, you know, the Serengeti, but Brian, let's, uh, let's hold the video for one second. Oh, we got it going. Okay. I don't want to give it away too soon how beautiful this thing is. But monarch butterflies, it's happening right outside right now, especially if you're in the eastern part of the United States. I was just in Vermont. I was in Tennessee. I was in New Jersey recently. And in all these places, I saw monarch butterflies 20 feet in the air, all flying in a certain direction. So if you go outside this week, 
look for monarch butterflies. They're bright orange and they're all flying in a single direction. And if you take out your compass, and I want you to do this, if you see one flying, ask someone around you if they have a compass on the phone, because most phones do. You'll look and they're all flying south. And they were all flying to the mountains of Mexico, where they all gather in the numbers that range from 50 to 150 million of them. And I go every year. And when you're there, you realize you're surrounded at every time by about 7 million butterflies. And when you look up, it looks like this. All right, now, Brian, you can play the video. Look at that. You see all those things on the tree on the right that are flying on it, that are kind of orange? Those are all butterflies too. This place is so full of butterflies that you can actually hear them. It's this like shh of just butterflies flying by you and flying by you. It's heaven. It's one of the most special places on the planet. And the reason that monarchs go down there is they basically migrate there to spend the winter. And they stay nice and cool. And then when spring hits, then they fly back north and they'll start in Texas, up to Ohio, even up to Canada. So some of these butterflies, especially on this way south that they're doing right now as we speak, the monarch migration is happening. Some of them fly 1,500 miles. And how do you do that if you're just flapping all day? That's gonna get pretty tiring. One of the best ways they do it is they go out and try to detect natural currents in the air. So if there's a warm updraft of air, they'll kind of fly that up and float up in that. And once they're at the top, sometimes even you know, 10,000, 15,000 feet high in the air, they'll then turn south and then just coast down and just go that way. So they basically try to take advantage of the natural climate that we have here where big uplifts and they'll go up in that and then they'll turn south, they'll get their bearing, their orientation and they'll fly. Now the way that they figure out where to go every year, um, that's still a bit of a mystery. We know a little bit about how they can orient themselves, actually using their antenna, have clocks inside them, and they look at the sun, and it's, it's crazy, but there's still so much mystery of how is it that all of these butterflies end up in the exact same spot in the same mountains year after year after year, and millions of them. It's, that's one of the things I love most about butterflies and science is there are these things that we can see, we can appreciate, we can love, we can, you know, experience, but we don't know why. And those questions are so fascinating and they keep me up at night and they keep entire careers going of being a scientist, trying to figure out why this happens. And on one hand, it's great to learn why, because it teaches us something new about the world and, and creates this wonder. And, and I think that's always amazing. But on the other hand, it also helps us do conservation, which uh, is something that we're going to talk about. So let's put butterflies in the big picture here of why are they important? Why do we want them to stick around? Um, and to start with that, let's, let's hit this question of how do you feel when you see a caterpillar eating your garden? Now, we oftentimes have an instinct to think of a caterpillar as a pest, something that is bad. So I'm looking at some of your answers here. Some people are saying, you know, it makes them angry because I get it. You put all this work into your garden. You want this thing to grow and be beautiful and something's eating it. You don't want that, right? But I'm also seeing some people saying they're happy. They're happy that the butterflies have food. They're happy that the butterflies have a place to call home. And that means I think you guys have been paying attention here because how great of a gift is that if your yard isn't just beautiful for you, isn't just something that you and your family and your friends get to go play around in and enjoy, but it's also something that butterflies can call home. They can go in there, they can you know, drink the flowers, but they can also lay eggs that their caterpillars then eat your plants. And that means your home actually contributes to the native ecosystem, which is one of the coolest things you could ever do with a yard. Um, but let's, let's talk about why, why butterflies are so important to have around, to, to work, to keep around. Now, one of the things is that they're, they're pollinators, which is a word that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. They're integral to the food chain and they're good for the environment and tell us about the environment. So this pollinator idea is, you know, we talk about bees and flies and butterflies and 
Um, even bats can be pollinators. Um, what else? There's surprising things that can be pollinators out there. And what a pollinator is, is basically it, it's a tool. It's, it's really useful for flowers. It flowers need pollen to go from one flower to another flower. That's how they make seeds. That's how they make fruit. That's how a plant is able to reproduce and create the next generation of plants. So butterflies as pollinators, you can see that painted lady right now is on top of a, uh, some kind of cone flower. And as it's drinking the nectar, it's also picking up little bits of pollen on its legs, on its proboscis, on its wings. And then when it goes to another flower, it drops off some of that pollen, which then fertilizes that flower and helps that flower create seeds. So butterflies are super important as pollinators, but as are many other things out there that surprise us. Flies can be great pollinators. Bees, um, bats are amazing pollinators of some very specialized types of plants. So they, butterflies fall in this category of things that you don't think of, because we think of the honeybee when you think pollinator, but it's not all honeybees. Uh, they're also integral to the food chain. And we have discussed how delicious they are to certain things, like birds, like monkeys, mammals. I've seen shrews eat them. I've seen opossums eat them. Um, all sorts of mammals love to eat butterflies. And that's a gift. That's an important part of what they are. Um, you know, birds, some birds specialize in eating caterpillars. So they need to find caterpillars. They need to find those plants that are getting eaten by caterpillars in order for them to uh, be able to, you know, create more eggs and more offspring of those birds. So they're really important to the food chain. Um, they, butterflies get eaten and that's okay because that's kind of the way that the ecosystem is set. And then finally, they're good for the environment because they're good indicators of the environment. And what I mean by that, there's a fancy word that we use in science called a bio indicator. Now break that up into bio, like biology, an indicator, something that, that tells us something. It, it indicates what's going on in the environment. So bio indicator, uh, a butterfly is one of them, can tell us about the health of an ecosystem. So when I grew up in Colorado, in my backyard, let's say I would see 20 butterflies every single day and I loved it. I would sometimes catch them, I'd release them, I would raise their eggs, all that, 20 in a day. Nowadays, I bet you there's only 10 in a day that I would see in that same yard. So that's an indication that there's something missing out there. That is a 50% drop. That is half the butterflies are out there than were there in the 90s. And a lot of studies out there have been showing that butterflies are disappearing from our ecosystems and we don't exactly have one thing to blame, but there's a lot of ways that we can help. So butterflies are really good indicators because they're easy to spot, they're easy to count. So for scientists, that makes our job easier because we can go catch them, we can do surveys, we can um, you know, do really good math and statistics to be able to reproduce the same experiment year after year after year and let us know, hey, if butterflies are disappearing, that means there's something going on in this environment that's not quite right and we need to solve it. So that brings up the question of how, how can you help? The great thing is there are some really amazing ways to help that are honestly pretty simple. And I would say, if you have a yard, let's start there. If you have a local park, you could start there. If you even have a little patch of dirt on the side of your street, um, you know, I used to live in New York City and, and there was areas that you could help the butterflies. So one of the things I want you to do is to look for native plants in your area, native flowers. Most of the Eastern United States, something like goldenrod is amazing with this thing called Joe pie weed. If you plant those, you're creating a nectar source, a native nectar source that is really good fuel, really good food for butterflies to eat and to survive. The one that I care the most about right now is the monarch butterfly because their population's in a lot of trouble. So yes, when I'm down there and I'm surrounded by millions of them, it seems like they're okay, right? But what is now 50 million in the 90s was 150 million or 300 million. So we're missing half of the monarchs. 70% of the monarchs have disappeared. And there's ways that we can get around this. One of the things you can do is order milkweed seeds. So milkweed is the plant that the monarch caterpillar needs to survive. That's what they eat on. That's their special little diet. 
And a native one is most important. A lot of places will sell a milkweed that is not even from North America, or it's a um, tropical one, but you live in a, a more temperate, cooler climate. So you don't want to plant that milkweed, you want to plant the native one. And in general, go out there, go to your local nursery and say, I want to buy a native plant. Whether that is a native uh, berry or a native flower or a native shrub or even a native grass, all of those things end up helping butterflies. So um, get out there, do that. If there's a local park nearby and you see they're renovating or they have a garden there, ask them and say, which of these plants are native? And I'll bet you a lot of them are not. So that's a big issue that could help butterflies really make a rebound, really make our space, the places that we go out, that we play, um, their space as well. Because how great would that be if you're out playing frisbee or playing football or, or you know, dancing in the yard and you see butterflies come around and hang out in your yard too? I mean, that's a great day. That sounds like a good time to me. Um, so there we have it. Brian, should we get some Q&A going? What do you think? Let's do it. Well, uh, first, uh, you know, one, we, we want to make sure everybody has those native plants. We actually just bought some at my house. So uh, remember native plants, native milkweed is what we bought on your recommendation. Also, go. people should know part of the prize. So we'll, we're giving away uh, a butterfly net just like yours. And we'll, uh, we'll ask where the winner lives and send some native milkweed so they can help out. So if you, uh, if you participate in this next portion, remember we said to have cameras ready. Uh, we're gonna give everybody a chance here to take a picture with Phil. And uh, if you upload it to Instagram, we'll have the rules up on, uh, on your way out of exactly how to do it. Uh, you'll have a running start on helping butterflies and, uh, and then catching them so you can smell them too. So um, let's give everybody a chance to, uh, to take that picture right now. Phil, take it away. Okay. All right. Everybody say butterfly on three. One, two, three. Butterfly. All right. Get my net in there. A little bit of camera action. Get a photo of you. Amazing. I need a photo of this too. All right. Milkweed Perfect. and butterflies. It, Those are the things to do. Excellent. If you didn't get that picture, you can tell for, by now Phil smiles a lot when he talks. So we're going to get him answering some of your questions. So you'll uh, you'll have plenty of, of opportunities. Um, hey, one quick thing. Uh, we had a couple comments come out that were pretty okay. exciting. We had somebody mention that uh, they live in Peru and may have been to the, uh, you know, the, the town with the turtle tears. I'm, I'm screwing up. And I remember Frass, but Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so that's cool. So we've got uh, some butterflies, best friends here. We also have Arlo in Colorado, your old stomping ground said that he found a, uh, a monarch caterpillar today. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we had a ton of great questions. Um, one big one that a lot of people had is how big do butterflies get and what is the biggest butterfly? Okay. Well, the biggest butterfly in the world is found in the islands of Papua New Guinea, which are kind of north of Australia, but uh, south of Asia. It's in that, that island area there. And it's called the Queen Alexandra's Birdwing. It's the most fancy name ever. And its wingspan is about 11 inches. The female is huge, 11 inches, almost a foot wide. She's giant. The male's a little bit smaller, but still very big. And a, a crazy story about them. The first European scientist who went to this area and said, what is that giant thing flying in the air? They didn't have a butterfly net big enough to catch it or tall enough to catch it. So they actually took a shotgun and shot it from the sky thinking it was a bird. And then when it landed, they were like, oh, this is a butterfly. That's how big that thing is. So yes, the Queen Alexandra's bird wing is giant and it's very endangered too. Um, it's one of those ones that is just so precious that we keep alive. And that's why there's just, it's just so important to think about your buying decisions of, Palm oil is one of the things affecting them. So um, try to avoid palm oil or only get sustainable palm oil. There's so many ways that every day you can do something to help butterflies, not only in your yard, but also around the world. Great, thank you. That's a, that's a huge butterfly. So yeah, yeah. we wanna make sure we keep those around. Yeah. Um, Audrina had a question that I think a lot of people also had, uh, but she wanted to know, are moths butterflies? So the answer is a fun one. Moths aren't butterflies, but butterflies are moths. Like essentially, if you look at the tree of life of how all Lepidoptera, that's the group of butterflies and moths are related, you have moth, moth, 
butterfly, moth, moth. So butterflies are basically a group of moths that's evolved and adapted to fly around by day. And that tells us a lot about why moths are so kind of boring to look at generally. They're, they're brown, they kind of look like bark, they whatever, because by day they're just hiding. They don't want to do anything. They don't want to be noticed. By night they fly around and colors don't really matter because it's dark. Butterflies fly around by day. So they have this opportunity to advertise their colors, to say, hey, I'm toxic, or hey, I'm this species. So, um, so yeah, it's butterflies are essentially a big group of day flying moths that evolved to have color and also evolved to just look pretty different to the point that you can differentiate a butterfly from a moth pretty easily. All right, mind blown. Actually, a few people have mentioned that you were blowing their minds, but that one uh, totally blew mine. So, um, so thank you. Um, hey, another one I know you and I were talking about before class. I want to make sure we get a chance to talk about it. How do butterflies taste things? Oh, well, that's a fun one because, you know, we taste with our tongue or we smell with our nose. Um, a butterfly smells with its antenna. So the two things sticking out the front, they're, they're covered in these sensors that basically as a butterfly is flying around, it is tasting the air and it is, or sorry, smelling the air and it is smelling for uh, nectar. It is smelling for the right plant to lay eggs on, or it is smelling for mate that maybe smells like Fruit Loops. So that's the way they smell the air, the way they, they taste though, when they land on something and want to say, okay, is this delicious or not? Do I want to eat this or not? Uh, they don't necessarily use their proboscis, that big curly thing that unfoils to drink, they use their front legs. They taste with their feet. So a lot of butterflies actually have the front legs kind of tucked in and then they'll go pop, 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 and they will touch around them. And that is them tasting. They have what are called chemoreceptors, basically things that can receive chemicals, that can detect chemicals right there on their feet. So it's, it's just butterflies are so weird. Like imagine if that's the way you taste it, if everything on your dinner plate, you're like, I'm going to grab the broccoli. Is it delicious? Maybe not. Maybe it is. I don't know. Um, so that you can learn just by touching. I'm kind of glad we don't taste with our hands because uh, I don't know how my cell phone tastes that I touch a lot or, um, you know, all the dirt we run in. So it's, it's pretty amazing that butterflies actually taste with their feet. That is incredible. That's um, yeah. I think you're right. We uh, we don't want to taste with our hands for sure. Um, hey, another really good uh, question that came out was uh, Abigail. Uh, you know, mentioned we know that you know butterflies have amazing colors. Can they come in any color? She wanted to know. Um, are there any colors that they're limited to? And then you know, what's your favorite butterfly you've ever seen? Just in terms of how beautiful they look. Okay. Um, so coloration is can be kind of complicated with insects. So sometimes, and in nature in general, sometimes the color is a pigment, meaning something is actually red or black. And lots of times that'll be in the scales of the butterfly. Those, each scale that is tiny on there has a certain color. So sometimes they're actually orange or red, um, but then there's colors like blue, which it's really hard in nature to create the pigment of blue. Uh, it's kind of complex why, but the way that they've evolved to do it is instead like a blue morpho. Maybe some of you are familiar with that. If not, you should Google it. They're beautiful and dazzling. Their blue is structural coloration, meaning it's like a tiny crystal on their wing that when the light comes in, it bounces around the crystal and then it comes out blue. And they do this on like the nanoscale level. So they can have pretty much every color, but the hardest ones for them to do are blue, green, and purple those are probably the rarest colors. There's very, very few green butterflies. And do we know exactly why? No, that's one of the cool things about butterflies, but it seems like green is either not a good color to be because they get eaten a lot, um, or it's just a really tough color to evolve and maybe takes a lot of energy. And the energy it goes into being green, they don't necessarily get paid back in by surviving better. Awesome. Ask, ask a, a simple question. You've got a, like a deep answer. That's pretty amazing. So I challenge everyone to go out and try to find a green butterfly, but uh, might, might be tough because maybe oh, it's no. camouflage too. Yeah. So, uh, hey, Brody in Maine has had a bunch of amazing questions. Um, one of his was he wanted to ask, and I think we've got the, the science to back. How do they lay eggs is what he wants to know. Okay. Um, well, the female has a few different kind of chambers in the back. And so she's got one of those chambers just full of eggs. 
And the process usually goes is they, they fly around and they're detecting the air with their antenna and they're smelling for the specific plant that they need to lay their eggs on, which is called the host plant. So some butterflies, some, some insects can basically lay eggs on any plant. Um, like the cabbage white is a really popular one. You'll see that little white guy flying in most yards across the world can lay eggs on dozens, hundreds of types of plants, but some like the monarch only need a specific plant. So they smell for that plant. And when they get closer, they actually will touch it with their feet to taste it. And they actually will smell for the presence of another one of their own. So if a monarch lands on a milkweed and it can detect a egg on that milkweed or a caterpillar, it says, I'm not going to lay an egg here because that's competition. That egg was laid before mine. So that one's probably going to hatch first, eat the food first, and that won't be good for my egg. So they fly around and try to find one that doesn't have eggs or doesn't have caterpillars on it. So there's a lot that goes in beforehand. But basically, the female will have made it with the male. And then they actually store the male's parts inside the female. And then when it comes out, they lay the egg. It's fertilized. And Many species will only lay one egg at a time, but they'll lay hundreds of them. They'll just fly around. And then there's other species, like the morning cloak is one that some may be familiar with. It's, it's common here in the US and in Europe. Um, they have what are called gregarious caterpillars. They're caterpillars that all hang out together. So they lay you know, 50 eggs at one time, and then all those caterpillars hatch, and they all kind of live together and they kind of protect each other. When a predator comes by, they'll all start bobbing and moving like that, and it kind of scares away the predator, the parasites. So they have different strategies, but um, at the end of the day, a, a female butterfly will lay 100 to 300, maybe more than that eggs, and only a handful of those will ever make it to an adult. So it's a tough world out there for a caterpillar, and that's why they, they try to lay them in as many special places as possible. Wow, that's fascinating. That's, um, yeah, so when you see a butterfly, you're seeing like the true survivor. Oh, it took yeah. a lot to get there. So, oh, and then, yeah. and, you know, birds are trying to eat caterpillars. That's wild. So, uh, all right, that's, uh, that's that much more exciting when we see them out in the wild. That's perfect. All right, two more questions for you. Um, one, we'll, uh, we'll do kind of, we'll, we'll save one for the most common one, actually, for last. Um, you've got a pretty amazing job traveling around to exotic places with a cool camera, learning about, uh, you know, butterfly bird. For kids who are um, excited about animals of any type, um, what should they be thinking about now to someday get a job like yours? Well, that's a good question. I think for me, um, you know, I was really driven by my passion. I knew that most of my friends when I was in elementary school wanted to play on the Dallas Cowboys as a football player, and I knew I did not. I knew that the things I was most passionate about was being outside, was nature, was trying to find a caterpillar in my yard when you know no one else could see that. That was kind of the game I played with myself, was if I walk around this forest, what am I gonna see that maybe no one else will see? So I, I kind of started young with just saying, these are things I really love doing, so I'm gonna spend my time doing it. I had so many books on butterflies, and I'd watch nature documentaries on butterflies and all sorts of animals. And so I learned these things that when I was, taking science classes in high school, I was like, wait, I already know that because I learned that when I was younger. Um, so you can really learn a lot just by, you know, using field guides and all that to, to not only gain an advantage of knowledge, but also gain an advantage of knowing what you love to look for, knowing what interests you. If you find you're fascinated by whales, go for it. Like, why not? Learn everything you can about whales and the questions that we don't know about them, because that's, that's amazing. We need more people like that out there. So I started just kind of following my passions and kind of setting these goals in 10 years where I thought I would be. And, uh, and when I knew I wanted to study entomology at Cornell University, I knew that by the time I was like 10 or 11 years old, that made it easy for me in high school and middle school to say, okay, I know that's my dream life to travel the world. So what, what are these little decisions I can make? Maybe I'm not gonna get in trouble. Maybe I'm not gonna do that thing because is that gonna get me closer to what I really wanna be doing? I don't think so. So it really helped me navigate. And of course I made mistakes. Of course I would get in trouble and do dumb things as any human does, but I always would look at it at the perspective of what is my dream life that I'm really trying to go for. And, um, and I, was, I was lucky to be able to pursue that and study hard. And I skipped out on skiing during the weekends and studied and was kind of a nerd instead. And, and I loved it. Being a nerd really pays off when you're older. Um, so go for it. it. It gives you a really fun, rich life. 
That's awesome. Find out what you're nerdy about and then you just enjoy it. So yeah. um, that's uh, really good advice and inspiration. That kind of gets us to the next thing. So you're talking about learning about, you know, what there are a lot of things we don't know. And so if you're learning about something, um, you know, you can start to ask the questions that will find those answers. We're going to talk about in your next class. Uh, how you even disco help discover a species of spider. The number one question. So a lot of people had good spider questions because they've, they've seen the image. Uh, we're going to talk about that coming up later this fall. But the number one question is what kind of spider is in your face or on your face in the, uh, the picture that promoted this class? Oh, well, that's a, a fun one. Um, that's actually not a spider. It is a different group of uh, arthropod called a tailless whip scorpion. The scientific term is an amblypigid. Um, the way I remember that is it sounds like you're saying Taylor Swift scorpion. If you say that fast, Taylor Swift scorpion versus tailless whip scorpion, it's kind of the same thing. So that's your way to remember what that thing is. A lot of people recognize that from a scene in Harry Potter. Now I, I've read some of the books, but I haven't seen the movie, but apparently that is the giant creature that goes in. And believe me, when, you, when I first saw these in the jungle, I was like, these are terrifying. They have these really long front adapted arms that can be like two feet long because they, they are nocturnal. So they don't really have eyes and they feel the world around them. They even use those to kind of lure in their prey. And then up the front, it looks like a, like a chamber of like claws and it's so scary. And that's what they used to crab their prey and then eat it. So I was terrified when I first saw one, but then I was like, wait, what happens if you try to put it on your hand? And Imagine if you spend two years in the jungle, sometimes late nights, it'll be 2 a.m. And you're like, you know what? I'm a little jungle crazy. Let's try this. So you kind of pick this thing up and we're like, wow, it's, it's being really nice. It kind of likes us. What's the next step? Well, let's try putting it on our face and taking a photo. And once I realized that that was something you could do with that species, um, I give tours sometimes into the Amazon and I introduce people who've never stepped foot in the jungle ever before. And, you know, day one, everybody's terrified of bugs and spiders. You know, maybe they're into birds or something. Day five or seven, you know what they're doing? They're sticking that thing on their face too for a photo. So it's, it's uh, I really think immersing yourself in these things that you maybe even fear, um, it turns you curious, it turns you fascinated and really kind of converts that fear into excitement and wonder. Um, and we'll get into tons of that when we talk about spiders later this year. Man, that's good advice. So yeah, find out what you're, what you're passionate about, but also start to learn about what you fear and then you don't have to fear it as much anymore. So um, amazing advice, Phil. Hey, thanks for, for all of your time. I know it's, uh, it's a school night, so we don't want to keep people too late, but uh, people had amazing questions. Please come back soon for the spiders lesson and, uh, and you'll learn a lot there too. Um, on the way out, we're going to, uh, to put up the instructions so you guys can take advantage of the photo contest. Again, if you put it up on Instagram, Tag Phil, tag Varsity Tutors. You'll be entered to win a butterfly net and some local milkweed so you can help out. Perfect. So, Phil, hey, thanks a ton. Everybody else, um, check us out at varsitytutors.com for more exciting classes, including an upcoming class on spiders. And uh, thanks to everybody for all their participation. I know Phil started with butterflies in his stomach, but seems to have gotten over it. And I think we all have butterflies in our hearts now. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> Bye, everyone.